If you will turn with me, we're going to uh, jump a bit forward in the Gospel of Mark to Mark chapter 11. And we are going to look at Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Now, um, as I was working on it uh, this week, I realized I'd put a little bit more scripture in there than I actually wanted to take, take on this morning. So we're going to read down through verse 14. So chapter 11, verses 1 through verse 14. This is God's word. Please stand for the reading of God's word. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt and at a door out, tied out uh, at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, "What are you doing, untying that colt?" And they told him that what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David! Hosanna in the highest! And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came on to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. This is God's word. Please be seated. <coughs> As we enter into uh, the listening of our hearts to God's word and what he would have to say to us today through his word, let's join our hearts again in prayer and ask God for open hearts to receive. Father, uh, thank you so much for this passage that clearly reveals to us that Jesus, your son, is your eternal son, and he is the eternal king, the king of kings and lord of lords the president of all presidents, the prime minister of all prime ministers. He is the center by which all authority in heaven and in earth is centered and is disseminated out to all who have it, including those who are in authority in our governments and in the governments of the world. And so, Father, we want to lift up to you uh, all of the governments, all of those who are in authority, and especially our own, Father, and ask, God, that by your grace and mercy that they may uh, do what is right in your eyes, that they may call good good and evil evil, that they will cling more and more to righteousness and justice and less and less to greed and power. And we pray that across the board for all of our leaders. We pray that they will be like you, Jesus, willing to give up power for the sake of the people rather than to take power for their own sakes. We pray, Father, for uh, the many in our country who are uh, broken, many, the many in our country who are struggling, the many in our country who have no power and no justice. And we ask, Lord Jesus, that you would meet them and help them and strengthen them and remind them that there is a kingdom coming where the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Remind us all of that, Father, as we live, as we move in this country, as we try to navigate this culture. 
And Father, we pray, Lord, for the many in our congregation who have been struggling with sickness or who need surgeries or who face uh, the shadow of death uh, through a loved one or even in their own lives. We just pray, Jesus, and hold them up to you and ask that you comfort and strengthen them during this time. And we pray, Father, that you will work in our hearts as we look at your word. May you comfort us, convict us, shape us, mold us to be more and more in the image of your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray these things. Amen. So this morning, as I've said, we're going to bounce ahead a bit in the Gospel of Mark. We're going to look at chapter 11 and look at Jesus' ride into Jerusalem. Uh, We'll return and bounce back to our spot in chapter 4 after Easter. But uh, we want to look at the Palm Sunday and and Holy Week and Easter Sunday from the perspective of Mark. So if you look at Mark in the big picture, so it's 16 chapters, and it's divided almost equally in half. So from chapter 1 to chapter 8, you have this movement up where Jesus' popularity grows and grows and grows. You see his ministry expand, expand, expand. And then at the pinnacle of it all in chapter 8, the end of chapter 8, there's all of this rumor happening out there. And people are saying, who is this Jesus? Who is he? And so Jesus comes and says to his disciples, well, who do you think I am? And so they have, well, people are saying this, people are saying that, some say you're Elijah, some say you're one of the prophets. And then all of a sudden, Peter opens his big mouth, and in this particular case, he's actually speaking the words from the Holy Spirit, that's what uh, the scripture says, and he says, you're the Messiah of God, you're the Christ, you're the one we came to expect. And Jesus says to him, you're right, Peter, the Holy Spirit is the only one who could have shown this to you. Now, here's what I want to tell you about Messiah. And and immediately in chapter 8, verse 31, this is what Jesus says. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And then Mark adds this little note. And he said this plainly. (laughs) Okay? So... They're used to Jesus telling stories, parables, metaphors, and for most of us who have a very logical, straightforward mind, parables, stories, metaphors don't make sense to us. But Jesus said this as straight as he could. He's trying to help them understand who Messiah really is and what he will do. And so it's in the background of that that Jesus now moves his way in the next eight chapters on his road to Jerusalem to the cross. And so this is just a stop along the way, a stop where Jesus uh, rides the donkey, but he rides it into Jerusalem knowing what at the end of that week means. The end of that week means he will suffer and die on the cross. So that's where we are. Let's look at verse 1 of chapter 11. It says, now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples. So it's interesting, Jesus actually enters Jerusalem, or he comes over the eastern mountain of Bethphage and Bethany, and all of a sudden, when you get to the top of that peak, you're right at the the Mount of Olives, all of Jerusalem is laid out for you. I mean, it's a beautiful, beautiful sight. And I can imagine, um, you know, we go there today and we see it all laid out for us and we see the dome on the rock, it's beautiful, golden cupola is beautiful, but my guess is Herod's temple was like three times as beautiful as that. My guess is you came over that rise and you just saw this huge, massive, golden building laid out in the sun and it took your breath away. And that's the venue that Jesus chooses to take his ride into Jerusalem, is over that particular eastern mountain. It's a great choice for Jesus. It's a great choice for the heir to the throne of David to enter Jerusalem. Now let's look at verses 2 and 3. And he said to them, the two disciples that he'd sent on ahead of him into the villages, 
Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and we'll send it back here immediately. So the disciples are instructed to enter that first village, Bethphage, and they will enter and they will see a donkey tied right on the edge of town and it's colt. I, this is my own kind of interest in trivia, but the Greek word for horse or full of a horse is polo. So now we know where Ralph Lauren got his word. Um, but beyond that, the symbolism actually runs very deep here. Jesus is intentionally riding the colt of a donkey. It identifies him as the Messiah from Zechariah 9.9, 9, that Messiah would ride into Jerusalem in this manner on the foal of a donkey, and people would understand that this unridden colt was part of a holy purpose, that there was a greater part to it. Everybody understood something bigger was going on here than they recognized, and both of these symbols Jesus embraces. And yet he will continue to communicate the truth about Messiah, which is Messiah is not what they think. Messiah is not the conquering hero who will bring about God's ultimate judgment at this time and free everybody from the rule and oppression of whatever nation is oppressing them. And he's not riding to conquer, that he's riding on to be crucified. Most thought, Messiah would be the ultimate conqueror, and instead he becomes the consummate sacrifice. All right, so there are two little details that I want you to notice about this little section of of verses, especially verses 9 and 10. Look at those with me. It says, And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. All right, so the first detail I want to draw to your attention is that we see Jesus becomes the fulfillment of an ancient promise that was made to David a thousand years before this. Before this ride into Jerusalem, God had promised David something. Now, David, of course, had made up his mind that he was going to build this big, beautiful house to God, this huge temple, and dedicate it to God. And he had all of this in mind, and he's about to to lay his plans uh, to work. And the prophet Nathan comes to him and says, no, don't do it. God is saying, do not build a house for me. I don't need it. I will let your son build a house for me, but not you. You are a man of blood. And so then Nathan speaks to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16, and this is what God says. He says, you're not going to build a house for me. And then verse 16, your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In other words, you're not going to build a house for me, but I'm going to build your house so that it lasts forever. So <clears throat> how does God promise David an eternal dynasty? How does he promise him an eternal house? Because we all know, as we've looked back over history, that every single family dynasty has fallen into ruins. Every single family dynasty and kingdom has, come to, has fallen to pieces. How can God promise David that kind of promise? And the answer is this, that God plants into the line of David his own eternal son who will reign over all the people and all the nations forever. He will be, in the words of Paul's letter to the Philippians, he will be the king of kings and the Lord of Lords. David is thinking his own like personal dynasty. God is thinking, I will bring the king of the world through you. So that's the first detail that I want you to notice here in this passage as they call out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. So they're thinking really small, but Jesus knows really big what's happening. All right, the second detail I want to point out to you 
is that the word Hosanna. Now, I think a lot of people get it confused with the word hallelujah because they sound a lot alike, and they're both Hebrew words, but they actually have two very distinct meanings. The people, <clears throat> hallelujah simply means praise the Lord or praise Yahweh, whereas Hosanna, the very root of Hosanna, is actually Jesus' name. It's Yeshua or Hashiach. It means save, the one who saves. Or in this case, it's save me, I pray, is what they're crying. So in this particular case, they're crying, save us, O king. Save us, O son of David. And so Jesus rides forward to save his people. He is going to answer that prayer, but not in the way that they think. He's not going to save them from Roman oppression, but he's going to save them from sin and death. So I want to look at this. How is Jesus going to do that? I want to look at that from actually the book of Hebrews, because the book of Hebrews helps us understand. In a few short days, Jesus is going to offer himself as a sacrifice for the sin of the world. And he's going to do it in a particular way. Now, normally they would think that if he was going to do that, he would ride into the temple, into the Holy of Holies, and offer his sacrifice there for the sin of the world. But <clears throat> what the book of Hebrews points out to us is that um, the Holy of Holies that's right in front of them, all of the furniture of the tabernacle, even the courts, are simply a symbol of the reality of God's place in heaven. That all of these things are merely symbols that point to something greater. <clears throat> and the thing that the Holy of Holies and where the, the high altar is, is actually before the throne of God in heaven, before his very presence. And this is what the book of Hebrews says <clears throat> in Hebrews, I didn't bring that, I think it's chapter 9, <clears throat> verses 11 and 12. Here's what it says. When Jesus appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come. Then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hand, hands, but that is not of this creation. In other words, not this temple that you're seeing in front of you, not this tabernacle that used to be there, but the one in the heavens. He says, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by the means of, of the blood of, bull, of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood, securing thus an eternal redemption. And so what the writer is telling you is that Jesus took his sacrifice, the sacrifice of his own blood, and entered into the holiest of holy places right in front of the throne of God in heaven, and he offered his sacrifice once for all, for all people, for sin and the sin of his people. That that's what Jesus did. So let's back up to the word Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. They're crying out, Jesus, save me before the highest place, before the throne of God. And Jesus is saying, yes, I'm going to do that. I am going to save you by riding into Jerusalem, by being crucified for your sins. You know what that means, don't you? Hosanna is like one of the most powerful and effective prayers that you can pray. Save me, I pray. Save me, I pray. When you're at the end of your rope, when you're at the end of yourself, when you're at the end of your ability to do anything, fix anything, change anything, the best prayer that you can pray is Hosanna. Save me, I pray. Now, this prayer has a lot of forms. I mean, it doesn't have to actually be that exact form. <laughs> it can just simply be a help me, Lord. It can simply be, I cannot help myself, Lord, help me. It can be like, uh, if you remember Nancy's, Terry's testimony from the summer, she just cried out and said, God, I'm sorry. And God heard her prayer. It can be um, a, like a friend of mine who was dying of stage four lung cancer, and he just said, okay, God, I don't know what you, what you need from me, but it, 
whatever you need from me, take me. I'm yours. So all of those can be a Hosanna-like prayer. Do you see the nature of them is just simply crying out to God to meet you and save you exactly where you are. And what happens is, is that when your troubled heart travels to the Holy of Holies, travels to the throne of God through prayer, and you cry out and say, Jesus, save me, God always answers that prayer. Jesus says, I did save you. I died on the cross for you. Hosanna is not just a powerful prayer, but it's also an appropriate prayer. I mean, think about the many times that David, in the Psalms, cried out to God, God save me. And think about all the situations that David cried out, and Korah and Asaph and all of the writers of the Psalms cried out to God in so many different ways, Lord, save us. It's an appropriate prayer. David must have prayed that Hosanna kind of prayer maybe 10,000 times if he prayed it once. He prayed it when he thought he was going to lose in battle. He prayed it when he thought the political intrigue would overcome him. He prayed it when he thought uh, that he was, when he was depressed. He prayed it when he was anxious. He prayed it when he failed. Clearly, the, as the children of God, we have access to God at any time and are able to pray, Lord, save me, I pray. That's our benefit as children of God. <clears throat> And so in these first verses of this passage, as you can see in your outline, we see a new king and a new kingdom, which is a fulfillment of an ancient prophecy to God's uh, friend and king, King David. But now I want to just take a, a couple of minutes and look at how this kingdom gets carried out, because it's kind of interesting um, now that the people are hypersensitive to what kind of king, I mean, he's already said, okay, I'm that king, I'm that Messiah, and everybody's like, okay, what's he going to do? What's he going to do? And they're really hypersensitive to what Jesus is about to do in his kingly position. And so there's just a couple of things I want you to notice here in verses 11 through 14 that demonstrate that this is a new kingdom that's above and beyond, the second point in our outline, that it's a kingdom that spreads into everything. A kingdom that spreads into all the little nitty-gritty things of life. Look at verse 11 with me. And it says, And he entered into Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So Jesus, in verse 11, it tells us that what Jesus did after he rode into Jerusalem. So he got off the donkey at some place, walked into the temple complex, and just looked around. He kind of reconnoitered, you know. He's doing a, a scouting episode for what's going to happen because he's in the a, in a next day he's going to go in there and clean house. So on this particular day, he's looking things over. It's in the evening. And so he observes all the money changers, all the animal sellers, all the trinket punters, all of those things that he's about to throw out on the next day. And then he goes back to Martha's Airbnb in Bethany. Now, R.C. Sproul makes a comment about these verses that I think is really helpful here. In 586 B.C., this is a, you know, almost 600 years before this happens, Ezekiel the prophet observes a really interesting thing. So he's in a vision. He's out somewhere along uh, near the city of Babylon, and he has this vision. And what he sees is he sees the glory of God lift up from the temple and leave it. And he sees the glory of God come over the East Hills, come over Bethany and Bethphage. And what you're seeing here in the Gospel of Mark is that God's glory returns through the person of Jesus Christ down into the temple again. That that's what you're seeing here as we observe Jesus entering into Jerusalem as we see him walk way into the temple. And I can't help but think, what would happen if Jesus came walking down through our church aisles? What would he see? 
Would he see what we desire to be, people who are serving and worshiping God joyfully, wonderfully with our whole heart? Would he see that? Would he see people waving their hands and their palm fronds? Or would he see, like in the synagogue, people sitting in the front row being critical? Would he see, like in... Um, <clears throat> As he enters the temple, would he find uh, people who are truthfully engaging in worship, or would he find us on vacation? Would he find us on mission, or would he find us on vacation? Six of us uh, from the church here are going through a study called Life on Life, which kind of lays out five elements of transformation. How does, how does a person's life actually transform to be more like the life of Jesus, and there are five things that are essential to that. One of them is truth, the truth of God's word. It's being equipped in the truth. It's being held accountable to the truth. It's then taking those things and going on mission, and then prayer. Those five things are critical. And if I were to guess, or if I were to take one thing that I think is missing in most kind of worship services or Bible studies or almost anything that we do as a church, it's mission. It's really hard for us to take what we hear and move out on mission. As we're going out into our life, as we uh, are being put on mission by the glory of Christ, coming back into the bare spaces of our lives, he intends for us to share our life in our faith with those around us. He intends for us to look around to the people who need restoration in their lives. He intends for us to be kind and compassionate to those who are down and out. We're meant to be on mission. As the glory of Jesus comes over and begins to fill out all those empty spaces in our lives, we're meant to be set and empowered on mission. He stirs up our hearts. We see the broken, the stranger, the lonely, the widow, the orphan. And I hope that your heart is stirred by the glory of God. That we don't put those things to death within us, but we make them more alive through the Spirit of Christ. Because Jesus is returning with his glory. And he's filling our lives, all the pieces and parts of it, in order to clean us up, to dwell in us, and to put us on mission. Let's look at uh, verses 12 through 14. So we've watched as Jesus' kingdom is supposed to spread. His glory is supposed to spread to every area of our life. And this little parable here actually tells us that it's supposed to spread into the little minutia of our life, even when we're hungry and looking for something to eat. Uh, Mark chapter 11, verse 12. And on the following day, they came from Bethany, and he was hungry, and seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if it could, he could find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And the disciples heard it. Now, as you can imagine, this passage has caused consternation among scholars and Christians for ages, and non-Christians, often Atheists will point at this passage and say, see, Jesus is just like us. He's a vindictive, you know, hurtful person. And so this, we understand that because obviously this is like the only miracle where Jesus' power is actually used to destroy instead of to build and recreate. So what is happening here? And again, scholars have a lot of different opinions. Uh, here's the way that I think it happened. This is, the, this is the story that makes the most sense to me and in character with Jesus. So here's the explanation I like. I think it's probably most true to the character of Jesus. Okay, so he's traveling towards Bethphage, right? Bethphage literally means the house of figs. So there's all kinds of fig trees there. Um, <clears throat> it's springtime now, like this time of the year, and like this time of the year here, all of the trees have blossomed out in their foliage, okay? And so 
Uh, in this particular case, all of the trees have their full leaves, and they're really starting to set on the buds that become figs. So they're either in a flowering state or they're in a state where the flowers have already appeared and the little fig buds are started. Now, believe it or not, those little fig buds are nutritious and provide food for somebody who's like really poor, like Jesus, okay? And if you haven't been to a third world country, you should because it helps you understand what more what this is like that you eat anything that you can eat because you don't know what's going to be there for the next meal. And so these little fig buds would be nutrition for the day ahead. And it says Jesus is hungry. He sees the full uh, leaved out fig tree, and he's thinking, oh, there's going to be little fig buds there. I can have just a little midday meal. He reaches the tree, and he finds that there are no fig buds. In other words, this fig tree is actually barren. It's not going to produce fig buds or figs, maybe ever. And so he looks at it, and suddenly he realizes that this is going to be a really good opportunity to teach his disciples something. And he says to the fig tree, may you never bear figs again, because it's not going to. And you'll find out a little later, the fig tree withers. And what Jesus is trying to communicate to his disciples is that the kingdom of God spreads into everything, including little things like when you're hungry and when you want to eat. And he says to his disciples, you can pray kingdom kind of prayers that even include things like a a, a fig tree or hunger. Now, you can ask God for these things, and he will always hear you. He's saying that the kingdom of God covers everything, even the small things about being hungry and the buds on fig trees. There is no place on this earth where the kingdom of God does not permeate where it cannot be found. And that's what the glory of God coming over the mountain is meant to do. It's meant to permeate every single aspect of our lives. So I want you to, along with me, take a bit of an inventory. Think about the areas of your life that remain untouched by the glory of God. Your work life, your family life, your thought life, the life you live when no one else is looking, your life when your friends, just your friends, are looking. Your emotional life, your fears and anxieties, your joys, your celebration, your griefs or sorrows. You see, nothing is meant to be left untouched by the glory of God. Nothing will be left untouched by the glory of God. And then I want to ask you, where in that inventory might you need to pray a Hosanna prayer? Lord, save me. I pray. Where in all of that parts of your life do you need to pray the Hosanna prayer? Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your word, which is powerful and effective. We thank you for just the time we get to spend in it. We thank you for how your word touches every aspect of our lives, and it leaves no stone unturned, no piece of our life untouched. And we're thankful, Lord Jesus, that your glory is rolling inevitably around the world and into our lives. And so, Lord, we pray, help us to embrace it, see it, let it move. And, Lord, I pray, open up our hearts today to those areas where we need to pray, Lord, Save me, I pray. For we pray this, Jesus, in your glorious, wonderful name.